A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ankita from NASCOM. Last time we heard from Subinda on COVID-19, beyond survival, build strength, and find growth. Today, Subinda, who is chief architect with Story Process, will share his perspective on empathetic listening, touching hearts, not hands. So stay tuned. Before I hand over to him, I would like to tell, please ask questions anytime during the session. Subinda will cater to most of them after his presentation. Also, do not forget to leave your feedback to help me improve my future webinars. Again, welcome Subinda and over to you. Uh, thank you, Ankita, and welcome everyone. Uh, okay. Now, all, all salespeople understand the power of in-person meetings, right? So whenever there is a, a critical uh, point in in that sale you want to have you want to be in front of your customer whenever uh, there is a a crisis you want to be there right uh, if it's a if it's a big enough client you want to meet them regularly so in person meetings are very very powerful we we all understand that uh, but now we are in a different circumstance right and uh, what do we do to make sure that we up the empathy uh, I mean, in all interactions, but especially when it's when we're not in, in uh, front of them. Is, is there a way that we can structure uh, these interactions to uh, give us far more, uh, you know, far, far deeper connection with our customer and, and build empathy, which we all know is a critical part of building a relationship and, and selling. Now, I'm going to start with a story, uh, and this is from Airbnb founder Brian Chesky, uh, and this happened around 2014 uh, because you know he talked about it later, but you can piece together. It happened in around 2014. He said, you know, we put up these flyers across San Francisco um, anonymously, saying we're seeking a traveler. We'll photograph your trip to San Francisco if you let us follow you. Well, that's a very curious uh, thing that that Airbnb did. Uh, you know, why are they doing this anonymously? Why do they want to follow you around? Uh, and what can we learn from it? You know, what is what? How is it relevant to all of us? Okay, we'll 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 come to that uh, in a second. But before we go there, you know, I really want I want to put up a question. Uh, Ankita, could I request you to put up the uh, the, the quiz question? Yeah, sure. Okay. And basically the question is, you know, what is the best way to sell? There are four choices, uh, A, B, C, and D. Uh, a is show that you have a great product. B, show compelling benefits. C, make them an offer, a very compelling offer. And fourth is link your product to the customer's priorities. So A, B, C, or D, what is the best way to sell? Please participate in the poll question. I'll end it in next two seconds. So here I'm closing the poll question. And the answer is, uh, so when the 0% says show that you have a great product, 12% say uh, show compelling benefits. Uh, this one, second one. Fourth one, uh, third is 4% says make them an offer they can't refuse. And 84% says link your product to customers' priorities. Excellent. So we have a very smart audience, right? The, of course, we want to link our product to customers' priorities. Okay. Because the moment we do that, the sale becomes their priority instead of our priority alone, right? When you walk in the room, it's your priority to sell to that customer. But the moment you link it to their priority, it becomes their priority as well, right? But then the million dollar question is how? How do you make it their priority? How do you link it to their priority? Okay. And, you know, uh, now, you know, some of you did talk about uh, the offer and the benefits, and let me just address that. Actually, there are three very important things for every sale uh, to happen, 
right? There are three closures in a sale. Uh, and the way I put it is, you have to make sure that you, they are convinced about the product itself, which is you have to connect to their heads. You have to understand, you have to, to, to show them that you have a great product. It's a great platform. Uh, it's a great tech stack. It's scalable. It's robust, right? It's got all the right functionality. It's a great product. The second thing you have to convince them is it's got a great ROI. You have to close on their wallet. So you have to touch their brains. You have to touch their wallet, which is, you know, show them the, the, the benefits and the ROI, right? That they will actually make more money after taking your product, right? But the most important piece where you have to close is their heart, right? Which is they have to want the product. Okay. So every sale requires three closures to the head, to the wallet, and to the heart. Now, the, the good news is we know how to close to the, to the brain. We know how to close to the wallet, right? We know how to give compelling uh, features. We know how to give compelling benefits on ROI. What we usually struggle with is matters of the heart. You know, as we, uh, it like, uh, like most things in life, you know, in sales also, we get stumped by matters of the heart. Now, here's the, here's the dirty secret. Even though, yes, we need to close on the logic, we need to close on the ROI, the, the financials and the budgets, the heart is the most important. Because once somebody wants a product, it will trump all logic. It will, you know, they will justify the sale to themselves, right? So the most important closure is a closure with the heart, okay? And how do we get the closure with the heart, right? Uh, in fact, ability to win hearts is what separates winners from the losers, right? And especially now, especially now, because in the tech industry, we have two very major forces. Uh, you know, in the past, we could get away with a, with a great product because the need was so compelling. Nowadays, you know, most of us find that our products are very hard to differentiate. The customers have a lot of choice. Any product that you put out there, there's probably 10 others which are pretty close competitors. So it's very hard for you to stand out. Now that, you know, we are not able to uh, get in close proximity with our customers because of social distancing and people are saying this might last two years, maybe even more if we don't find a vaccine in time. It gets even more uh, of a differentiator if you can win hearts, right? So the uh, key to success today is how do you differentiate? Not, not just on technology, you know, that's going to become a minor differentiator, not just on features and benefits, but on how do you touch hearts, right? And that's uh, which where the topic of today comes in, but how do you win hearts? And, you know, we encounter some of those problems uh, even in a normal sales cycle. So, you know, when you hear somebody says, uh, you know, the client is convinced about the product, but I don't get that sense of urgency. What are they really saying? It's not a priority for my client, right? So unless it is linked to one of their priorities, they won't have the urgency. When you link it to their, uh, to their priority, the perceived value of your product goes up. Therefore, you can charge a higher price. You're, you know, the, the pricing discussion becomes a lot easier, right? So there's a lot of benefits to connecting to their hearts. Okay. And there are, there are three steps. This is where linking to their priorities comes in. When you, to win their hearts, the first part is how do you link to their, you have to link to their priorities. Second part is you have to tap into their emotions. And third part is you have to leverage storytelling. Okay. And today we will, we will only uh, look at the first point. Uh, you know, in, in other sessions, we will, we will look at some of the other topics like storytelling. Today we are going to talk about how do you link to their priorities? Okay, so before we talk about how you do it, let me just show you what it looks like. So when 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 you uh, a product is linked to the customer's priority, what does it look like? Okay, and I'm going to give two examples. One example is from Slack, right? And most of us are familiar with Slack. 
uh, you know, have probably used the product. Uh, we know that it's it's a it's a very loved product in the industry. It's uh, you know, it's the 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 company has the distinction of uh, the fastest from uh, zero to a, a unicorn status. You know, they they went to a, a, a in the B two B world, the 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 fastest growing enterprise product ever. They went from zero to unicorn in four years. Okay, and what I have here is a quote from Stuart Butterfield, who is the founder of Slack. And Stuart really understands the power of linking to others' priorities, linking to users' priorities, and you know there's. Uh, other uh, quotes from from uh, Stuart as well on storytelling. You know, he talks about how if there was one thing he could go back and fix, is he would he would uh, pay more attention to storytelling. But but that's uh, a topic for a different day. So he's saying it very very clearly. Our job is to understand what people think they want, which is their priorities, and then translate the value of Slack into their terms. Okay, so this is. This is what it means. You have to understand what my customer wants and translate the value of my product into their terms, right? Other industries outside of technology have been doing it for ages because they had to, right? Harley Davidson, what does it sell? Does it sell motorcycles? Does it sell performance? Does it sell its, its technology? Yeah, but it really sells freedom and independence. And when we go to the CPG world, we see this a lot, right? We see that uh, the benefits being sold are actually, most of them are not product feature at all, but about, but they're emotional benefits that you sell, which are priorities for your customer, right? So this is what it looks like when you have linked to their priorities, okay? Uh, but before we can link it to their priorities, we have to discover what the real priorities are. So we can't assume that, we have to discover what the real priorities are how do we do that? This is where empathetic learning comes in. So empathy or empathetic listening is a way for us to discover their priorities so that we can link our products to their priorities and make it their priority and that's how the sales happen, right? We have to win their hearts. We can win their hearts only if we are linking our product to their priorities. But before we can understand, before we can link it to their priorities, we have to understand and that's where empathetic listening comes in, okay? So empathetic listening is the first uh, part of the sales process. And that involves three steps. Asking the right questions, listening for the signals, and apply what you heard. Now, we've you know, read and heard a lot about you know, the importance of empathy and you know, how uh, it's a very critical part of sales. What I'm going to talk about today is how do you systematically generate empathy? Now, some uh, top salespeople do this naturally. Leaders, some leaders do this naturally, right? What about the rest of us? Okay, and even for the people who do it naturally, you know, when they shake hands, when they are in front of a customer, they make a personal connection, they build empathy, something has changed for them, right? In the last month, they're not able to do that in-person uh, connection anymore. So even for those people, we need a better process now to build empathy. Okay. Therefore, we turn to others in other industries who have not had the luxury of personal contact. You know, today, we don't have the luxury of personal contact with our customers. Some industries have had that problem forever. For example, Airbnb. So the story I was telling at the beginning, why did Airbnb offer to follow around a customer? We will photograph your trip from San Francisco if you let us follow you, was to build empathy, was to understand the priorities, the understand the experience of their customer, right? Didn't go to the easy way of saying, okay, fill up a survey form, right? Or ask them, what do you like about my product? What do you not like about my product? No, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is you have to understand their world first. You have to understand their priorities first, whether or not they relate to your product. Okay, so how does that translate into actions for us? The step one we talked about, ask the right questions. Where do you start? So the first thing you gotta do is, you have to understand what is their major motivation. 
every one of us have our own motivations, our own goals, right? You have to understand that first, okay? And what's important here is, of course, you have to do your background research before you go meet that customer, if, you know, before you write to that customer, if you, know, if you have the luxury to do a, a, a face-to-face, whether it's in person or, or over uh, web, uh, make sure you've done your background research, but ask this question. And, and I'm gonna make a point about, you still have to ask them, not only to confirm, for, but for a very important reason I'll come to. Okay, so why is, what is your major motivation and why is it important to you? Okay, second thing you have to ask them is what stops you from achieving your goal? Okay, what is your major obstacle to that goal? Ask for specific examples. You know, so somebody might say, you know, I want to grow my business or I want to retain my customers. Not good enough. You have to ask for specifics. You have to ask for uh, examples. You have to ask for details because you want to get specific. Because, you know, there's a lot hiding behind those words that you want to know. The more you know, the more you can uh, connect and uh, the more effectively you can sell, right? At this point is when you bring up your product for the first time. Once you've understood their world broadly, and only if, you know, chances are your product uh, or something related to your offering has already come up. But, you know, sometimes, uh, so I'll go back to the Airbnb example. The customer is, you know, yeah, they want a clean room, they want a well-located room, they want, you know, the amenities, you know, all the product related stuff more than anything else, they want a great experience or they want to be able to uh, you know, maybe meet some locals. They, maybe they want to experience what life is like, which has really nothing to do with the Airbnb product, right? So it's important to get the bigger context and then come down to asking about your specific product, okay? And again, why is it important? So it's not just enough for you to ask what is it that you want? But you have to understand what the implication to their world is because ultimately their priorities are not, you know, I want this product, I want to consume your product or I want certain features. The priorities are what it does to their life, right? And what it enables, right? So I gave the Harley Davidson ex of example, it enables freedom, right? So people want to feel free when they are out on the road on a bike what will it enable you to do okay. and um thing is sometimes you will get answers which are shallow how do you know so you know i what i will always do is i'll ask why so what what will it enable you to do right so they might say oh it will enable me to go out on road trips I say you know why what does it enable you to do right uh, okay it enables me to go see friends whenever i want Great, now we probably have something, right? Or it enables me to experience the outdoors. Great, okay. Now, how do you know when to stop? And you know, I'll answer that question in a subsequent slide, but keep asking till you get to a core motivator. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you how you identify what is a, a core motivator versus what is not. But you keep asking the question till you get to a core motivator, okay? Once you understood why it's important to them, you also need to know what solutions they've tried so far. So this is your real competition, or this is the benchmark you have to beat. What solutions have you tried so far? Okay. And the last, and this is actually a magical question, which is what you want to know is if you could magically solve the challenge, the you know the obstacle that they outlined in uh, point number two. What is your major obstacle? So you say, if you can magically solve that challenge, what would the world look like for you, right? Um, and I'm gonna relate to the, to the story world, uh, you know, this is your happily ever after situation. Okay. And with the script, you get all the information that you need to understand your customer, build empathy, and to be able to sell it to them. Next, you have to listen and you you know, it's how you listen is, is uh, as important as just, just taking all the points down. So there are 
there are three cues. Of course, you want to get all the, the factual data, the answers to all those questions, but you're also listening for three signals. First, you want to get into specifics and implications. So don't make assumptions. You know, words mean different things to different people. And you want to get uh, into details on what that means. So freedom might mean something very different to me versus what it means to you. You have to understand, get into specifics, get into implications. Okay. Second thing is you have to record the keywords they use. So, uh, and this is a very important point. So, for example, you know, if uh, I'm talking to a customer and they say, you know what, uh, I want a cost effective solution. Right. Should I be answering and saying, you know, my product has the best TCO? I'm saying the same thing, right? I'm saying cost effective in a different way. But does it sound the same to the customer? Right. Or if they say, you know, we want something innovative. And I say, you know, we have the best cutting edge solution. It's the same thing, innovative, cutting edge, same thing. What's the difference? The difference is that in their own minds, there is a very different emotional reaction to the words that they use. So uh, to them, innovation will have a far stronger emotional reaction than cutting edge or any other synonym of innovation. And the example I like to give is, if you, you know, let's say you, you, you have your favorite song, right? And you try to whistle it out. You play your favorite song, you whistle it out. What is the other person hearing? Well, the other person is hearing probably some bad whistling, you know, assuming you're like me and not a very good whistler. You know, what they're hearing is some noise. What's playing in your head? What's playing in your head is a whole symphony. You're hearing that whole, the whole orchestra, you're hearing the, the words, the music, the, the, uh, the lyrics, everything, right? You're, you're enjoying the whole music, even though you've just, you're just whistling a rough rendition of that song. Well, the reverse is also true. If, if you hear a snippet of that song somewhere, you're not hearing that snippet. You're hearing the whole music because your brain reconstructs it, right? The same thing is with keywords. With the right keyword, what plays in your customer's mind is that whole symphony. So if they love the word innovation, they use the word innovation, that is the word you want to use because it'll have a lot of other emotions, a lot of other uh, you know, uh, ramifications of the word associated in their minds. And the whole thing will play when you say that word, right? So it's important to record the keywords they use. And third thing is you have to monitor what emphasis, what points they emphasize, and where they become more emotional, right? That emotion could be in the tone of voice. Uh, and of course, if you're in person, you can also monitor body language, but it could just be emphasis or tone of voice, and it, it betrays a lot. It tells you what is important to them. Uh, you know, the emotions are far louder. It's an underlining. It's almost like if somebody is writing something and they underline a word, you know it's important. Same thing, when they're talking and they emphasize a word, you know it's important, right? So this is what you, with the signals of what you listen for, right? And um, I have a video, but I think we have some audio problems uh, of a master who's actually, again, telling you how important keywords are. Uh, but uh, Ankita, I think we have a problem with audio, right? So uh, I, I'm just yeah. gonna skip this, right? I'm just gonna skip this. Okay, so what are you trying to do? You know, I, I laid out a script. I've given you the first two steps of a three-step process. What are you really trying to do? What you're trying to do is decipher their story. Okay, and again, I will turn back to Airbnb and, you know, Brian Chesky and let him talk about what he was trying to do when he was trying to uh, follow around, you know, and experience secondhand the world of his travelers. What they did with that, uh, information was they designed an end-to-end -end experience for somebody like they're in a movie. Okay? They leave their ordinary world, they cross over to, to a new magical world. We applied this to trips and this led to what we call Airbnb trips. So what the story I was telling you earlier was how the Airbnb trips product was con conceived, designed and launched. Okay? It was all about empathy and, and understanding. So you have to do something similar with your customer. 
basically what you're trying to do with your customer is you have to understand what is important to them, right? And then you have to give them an experience like they're in a movie and with your product, they get into a, a new magical world. And what they're telling you is what is important to them? What does their magical world look like so that you can enable it for them? Okay. <clears throat> now I talked about, you have to understand the drivers and the core motivation. How do you know when you've come to a core motivator? You know, they might say my motivation is to build a more efficient system. Is that really a core motivation? How do you know it's a base motivation? So there's a very simple test I'll give you, right? If they say, I want to build a more efficient system, that's not a base motivator. You have to ask, what will it enable you to do, right? So how do you know uh, when you have a base motivator? a core motivator, there is a time-tested guide, there's a time-tested Bible, the Bible in fact, okay? In the Bible, there are seven deadly sins, okay? Now, these are very powerful motivators, okay? They are so powerful, in fact, that they had to be declared as sins, because otherwise they can, they can, they are such powerful at driving uh, motivation behavior. Right. So as whenever you're connecting your benefits to one of these motivators, you know you've got it right. So I'll give you an example. When it comes to uh, convenience, right? A product which offers convenience. Well, that convenience is another word for sloth. Right. When you say a product gives me ability to outshine lead the market right market leader is the same as pride right i mean as long as you can you can relate the uh, motivator back to one of these deadly sins you know that it's you've got that down to a right motivator which is going to create a strong emotional reaction and drive behavior right so very handy guide a, a very good test to know that you have a strong powerful motivator and if you have a motivator which is not really in you know uh, something related to one of these <clears throat> it's not going to be a very strong compelling motivator you have to go deeper right um, and sometimes these things are not uh, you know they they camouflaged so uh, you know i gave the example of convenience sometimes it is um, you know um, you know, uh, hyper growth, right? Gluttony. So there are uh, a greed, right? So you, you would come up with more socially acceptable uh, words for these, but, but these are really very strong, powerful, right? So just recapping this, the first two steps, which is you ask the right questions and you go deeper and deeper till you get to a core motivator. You've recorded the keywords, so you know not only what the core motivators are, but what words invoke the right kind of emotional reactions in your, uh, in your clients or in your prospects. And you understand what is really important to them, what does their happily ever after world look like, which is the last question. Question number seven is, if you could magically solve this challenge, what good things like for you, right? Now, you're ready to present your solution because you have all the information it takes. Okay? You have to present a solution for the core challenge. So the, you know, I'm just gonna go back here. What is this question number two? What is your major obstacle to achieving your dream? If your product can connect to that major obstacle, now's the time to do it. So you say present it as a solution to that core challenge. Okay. Second thing is focus on what's important to them what's important to them using their keywords, okay? And the video I was gonna play of Tony Robbins uh, was saying exactly this. I mean, he was giving a real essay example where they say, uh, you know, somebody says, you know, I want a, a fabulous home and, and the, uh, you know, don't say I've got a fantastic home, say I've got a fabulous home, same, same concept. And third thing is you got to paint a picture for your customer, paint a picture for what things would look like with the solution, which is really, and they've already told you what that is, right? Which is the happily ever after. Right, uh, some technical difficulty here. So, 
Okay. Now that you've presented your solution, So what happens? So, you know, like I said, this is understanding their story, understanding their priorities, their dreams, their challenges, and helping them get there, right? What happens when you understand their story? You know, that's how you build friendships. That's how you convert a transactional relationship into a, into a friendship. And, you know, there is a very, very interesting uh, uh, quote I came across, you know, humans are social animals, so are dogs. How do dogs relate? Okay. Dogs relate by sniffing each other. Similarly, humans being human beings relate by telling stories. This is our native language, right? So what we have to do is make sure that we keep building relationships, even in the time of COVID-19, you know, um, yeah, we're not able to, to uh, you know, get there in person. We're not able to quote unquote sniff each other. But as long as we're able to share stories, we're able to build relationships, uh, we can beat that distance. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. And just one thing I would uh, request before that, uh, you know, uh, is there is, I'm going to share a link over here in the comments. Uh, this is uh, a LinkedIn post where uh, I would request you know, please post your comments, your feedback, uh, any questions, a discussion, uh, your stories. Uh, you know, you can post it for not just for me, but for everybody's benefit. Okay, and I would love to hear from you. Uh, you, uh, you know, sharing my email, but that LinkedIn post is actually a better way because uh, you know, then we can share it with the community. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll I'll open it up to questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Subinda. So let's just begin the Q&A round. All right. So the first question is by... Uh, the first question... Yeah, it is by Dr. Vinod. He's saying that uh, how ability win heart differentiate between winners and losers? Okay. So like I said, you have to win on three fronts, right? With, with your product, you have to win on, of course, the product quality, which is your tech stack, your scalability, how robust your product is, so on and so forth. The product benefits, so which is effectively the ROI that you're able to provide your customers and the product, you know, uh, you can call it empathy, you can call it empowerment, you can call it what it enables for your customer right which is the willing heart now all three have always been important okay in any sale you have to go through all three reality is always the heart has been the more powerful motivator except that in technology we had the we had the luxury of being able to differentiate ourselves on technology in the past you could actually have a significantly superior product not anymore today you know the most products are differentiated only on their positioning only on things like the ease of use or, or their, their, their uh, you know, how well they integrate into the customer's environment or how well they enable the customer, the ecosystem, right? Uh, and, and we kind of see that already, most of the winners, I mean, you know, the classic example is uh, an iPhone one, not because it was a technically superior product, I mean, the, that couldn't justify the price difference, but because of all the, the whole ecosystem, the app store or the music ecosystem that came along with it, right? So it's it's really about how do you win, you know, uh, how do you link to the customer's priorities and win their hearts? And I think we, we're tending to what the, you know, CPG industry has always had. Most products are differentiated only on the emotional benefits, right? Uh, where we have lagged in the tech industry so far is we've ignored the emotional benefits. We've kind of had that come out accidentally. Either the customers themselves close the gap or, you know, our, our star salespeople did that. Uh, now we need to do that systematically, right? So the companies who learn how to do this systematically in their product design, in their product development, in their marketing, in their sales, all of the customer touch points 
will systematically win over companies who don't. Next, please. All right, thanks, Abinder. The next question is by Webhav. He's saying, for example, if two competitors are pitching with same empathy, touching with their hearts, in, in that case, who will win the customer? So whoever hits closer to home, right? So <clears throat> like I said, all three are important. And ultimately, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, so first of all, whoever links their product best to the customer's priorities, right? Um, meaning they have to, they have to make sure that the customer feels like they will win a special advantage of, from using this product. Okay. And it's highly unlikely that two companies will have a similar proposition at that level, right? It, it could be something as simple as, I mean, you might have very, very similar functionalities, but one company is, uh, let's say, more focused on the customer's vertical than others. Then that company has an advantage because for the customer, you know, I want to deal with a specialist. I want to deal with somebody who's more meant for me, right? Because everybody believes they're different, they're unique, they're special. Uh, right. Having said that, yes, your product uh, quality is still very, very important. You have to back up that promise with your product, right? But the, the quality of the promise is going to be made, made in the emotional benefit or the empathy, not in the product quality. Product quality will come later. The emotional connect will come first. Next question, please. Yeah, uh, Nagarjan has a question for you. Um, isn't it difficult in general for people to communicate details? What if demos and discussions are steered by customers to know over letting us know their motivations, etc.? Okay, I'm not very clear what the question is, but it sounds like you're saying, well, if the customer starts to control the agenda, what do I do? Okay, here's the here's the secret. Everybody loves to talk about themselves. Everybody loves to talk about their priorities, their goals, their challenges, their difficulties. So it's usually not very difficult to prompt a question, or prompt a discussion, which is about them, right? The problem is that most of us, when we're selling, get in our own way in the sense that, like I said, everybody loves to talk about themselves, including us, and that's where the problem starts, right? So the thing is, don't get in your own way in the sense that if a customer is talking about what's important to them, don't interrupt, let them talk about it, right? What you don't want to do is try to get back on agenda with uh, a particular feature set or a particular demo that you had in mind. If the customer says start, right? What you want to do is very quickly get to a point where you're able to ask a question about what's important, right? So and it, it's it's you have to go in prepared. You have to go in understanding a little bit you know today the the benefit we have is you can look up anybody on linkedin most companies have a lot of uh, information that's publicly shared their priorities are publicly shared so it's very easy to prompt a question about what is important to your company right now what is important to you right now right even if you refer to one of you know you have a person in there you refer to one of their recent posts right? i mean how many people will say no i'm not going to talk about my own you know my own post what i really like and i'm going to tell you to first talk about your product very rarely would it happen so usually it's the other way around usually it is that the customer keeps talking about themselves and they may not get around to talking about your product i think that's the fear most sales people have okay okay uh, next question is by um, anupam saronwala is asking before you get to the point of asking the right questions we need to effectively engage with the decision maker on the client side so that the mm -hmm. right person is answering our questions any tips on right. how to effectively engage that is the get the first meeting uh yeah anupam you always ask the right the tough question <laughs> Okay, so anyway, that's that's a different topic, right? How do you get to the right decision maker? And um, you know, so I mean, I'm going to ask and answer a part of it. I mean, the the you already know the usual methods, right? You look for common contacts, you look for uh, some approach. Uh, the I mean, the channels will remain the same. Sometimes you can even write to them directly, 
the, what what I'm gonna tell you is change the content of your message, right? The content of your message, you know, what I see for most people is they are. So I mean, uh, the way I'll put it is most salespeople are trying to uh, beg, they're trying to bribe, they're trying to please. So you know, begging will take the form of um, you know. Uh, please give me uh, five minutes of your time, right? Not very compelling, you know, when somebody writes me, you know, no, please. And, you know, I even get messages that say, oh, come, you know, please take a few minutes and follow my company page. And I say, why should I do that, right? Uh, it's not, you have to link it to my priority. So, so the content has to be about what's important to me. Uh, so, it, you know, begging doesn't really work. You know, somebody says, I've got the cheapest product or I can give you the best deal, the best discount. Yeah, that's that's a form of bribing, right? I'll give you a free uh, a freebie along with the product. You know, that can work later in the conversation when we're getting into establishing the value or closing the sale, the negotiation, but it will never get somebody interested. You know? uh, the, the third form it takes is, you know, some sort of flattery. Right or something as simple as you know I, I hope you're doing very well today. You know when a stranger says that, my first um, reaction or my first thought is, what do they want from me? Right? Why is somebody trying to be nice to me? Right? So I, I'm I'm always in the favor of understand that person. You know, fortunately we have a lot of information, and it's still shocking to me how many people when they're writing to me or when they're talking to me have never taken the time to even spend 10 minutes on on social media to find out a little bit of background um, right so do a little bit of homework understand what the other person's all about try to link to their priorities ask a question in an area which is of interest to them right most people will love to talk to you about it okay it may not always work Right, but your odds will of uh, making a connection and, and having a meaningful conversation from there uh, is a lot higher. Okay, so the channels remain the same. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, the tenor of the conversation or the focus of the conversation. Okay, uh, next question, please. Yeah, Nikhil has a question. Um, how about the sample size of interviews? Suggestions for people in deep devastations devastation state because of the lockdown and can't really participate in interviews with correct mindset uh, i'm not sure what the question is can you uh nikhil can you or... just elaborate your question a bit so that uh, we would be able to take it up in the meantime let's get on to the next question uh subinda uh, Vishal is saying, hello, how to launch initiate calls with new clients during COVID phase? Huh. So, <clears throat> um, it, again, it's a tough time for everyone, right? So um, the good news is if most people are at home and most people have, uh, you know, more time than they usually do, right? Um, so I'm saying more time than they usually do, right? So very interestingly, in the VC world, the the thing I'm hearing most VCs, you know, most VCs are very hard to catch. You you know, you getting five minutes of the time is is a big deal. Today it's relatively easy to get twenty minutes of somebody's time, provided you've offered something of value to them, right? Uh, so it's it's relatively easier to to find people relatively easier to get time with them uh, you know it's it's actually uh, the opposite uh, of the way things usually are of course it's much harder to make a sale because uh, people's priorities have changed you know they're not the budgets have been um, budgets are under pressure uh, so make sure that you have an offering or make sure you have something which is of value to them which you know the something of value to them is it it means it helps them in their priorities, right? So as long as you have something of value to them, your chances of being able to connect with them are much higher today than, than they are in normal times, right? But uh, again, the usual rules apply. You have to reach out to them. You have to make sure your messages are uh, you know, properly worded. 
they're not a, a begging message they're not a uh, you know a bribing message they are actually offering something of value uh, you know the worst is when somebody writes a message to me over linkedin says hi hello how are you you know i mean i don't care how much free time i have you know i don't have time to go chit chat uh, with a stranger over linkedin but if there was a message which was interesting uh, yeah chances are i would respond so it's uh, really you have to you know the rules are still the same offer something of value uh, and you know follow the right protocols and you probably have a better chance today than normal Next, Very please. well answered, Subinda. Uh, next question is by Pradeep. How do we avoid the bias of our own expertise we have built in the area where we are building a product? Hmm. Yeah, so get out of your own way, right? Nobody cares about your product. I mean, that's the first thing you have to remind yourself is you're in this, you know, you might be in love. You have to be in love with the product, of course, right? But you know, I always cringe when I see a presentation and, and the first few slides, they're trying to explain their product suite and the nomenclature and the functionality and, you know, like, you know, make me care first, right, before you give me all that detail. So the, the idea is that approach it as a problem. So, you know, what I tell engineers is uh, just engineers are problem solvers, right? As long as you throw the right problem at them. So your problem, the problem definition is, you have to figure out what is important to the customer and connect your product to that, right? Solve for that, right? So don't let your product and your expertise get in the way. The first thing is you have to make sure that you, un you, are, uh, you, you understand, you have at least some sense of what the customer's priorities are, which means you do your research before you, before you even send them a mail. Make sure your mail is addressing that priority upfront right in the conversation go deeper in, and understand that more build that empathy then you have license to bring in your product only if you're able to connect it to their priorities right start with a product i don't care how good your product is doesn't matter make them care first next question please yeah paramdeep is asking how this touching the hearts is scalable especially in today's <laughs> inside sales scenario wherein yeah. person sales is difficult. Correct. So very good question again. So I, I say there are three stages here. So first is, you know, when you're in the initial stages of a new product, new offering, or a new new environmental condition. So, uh, you know, if you're launching a new product, you absolutely have to do this kind of empathy because you have to discover your customers, needs, priorities, wants, right? And how your product fits in there. If it's a very high value product, uh, it's it's worthwhile doing this, right? If it's changed circumstances like we have right now, the priorities for customers of two months ago are not valid today. So you have to restart the discovery process. So there are three conditions, new product, new conditions, and high value where you have to do this process. In Once you've passed this stage, so let's say you've got a product in the market already, you've discovered, uh, a few customers for whom it's working well, right? And now you're in scale up mode. Uh, then you have to do two things. Uh, one is you have to keep checking in periodically, course correct. So make sure that, you know, you're talking to a sampling of your customers and, and, uh, and revalidating and correcting your messaging. Second thing is to scale up that message. So now, you have to focus on a scale up delivery and there i'm i'm actually a big fan of videos right uh, you know if you if you remember i talked about the three steps i'm just going back to that slide uh, okay so you first is you have to link to their priorities what is what we have talked about in this session Second thing is now you have to understand their emotions, tap into them and leverage visual storytelling, right? You have to uh, tell stories with all your collateral, with your product, with your website, with all your messaging, and especially leveraging videos because, you know, videos like movies uh, can touch hearts much more powerfully. In fact, a good video is, 
uh, more powerful than a face to face just like a good movie can create an emotional reaction which is way beyond you know in any any uh, other form of storytelling right uh, so that's how you scale up once but obviously that only works if once you've understood what their priorities are and you understood how to tap into their emotions right uh, at that point you can scale up through storytelling especially videos next question please uh, rajiv is saying thank you for a great session you mentioned a point on asking right questions how do we achieve yeah. when the meeting have the set agendas and you are meeting your client for the first time so again i say you know even if there's a set agenda there will be a question right uh, there will be a discussion there will be some introduction right so let's say let's say a typical meeting how does it start they will do a quick round of introductions right best time to talk about you know somebody says you know i am head of marketing so you say okay what is your marketing agenda for the year what are your marketing priorities for the year what are your biggest challenges right now right okay you can see what what i have up on my screen i'm i'm just asking the same questions in a different way you will have plenty of opportunities to ask those questions okay uh, in any natural conversation just the, the thing is make sure that you're not rushing through to catch up on the agenda to say okay you know the agenda says i have to do a demo so i'm going to short circuit this process that would be the mistake right if you ask this question somebody starts answering ask a more probing question right if you ask the right kind of interesting question uh usually your problem will be the opposite where people will you know you'll you'll have a hard time shutting them up right you'll have a hard time having them stop so the thing is not get in your own way let your customer talk they will tell you everything you need to know because everybody loves talking about themselves Okay, Andre, question, um, yeah, uh, Ranjan has a question. When we do not meet clients in person, how do we create the emotional connect during presentation? Okay, so same. I mean, my, I, I'm going to repeat the the answer I just gave. You, you know, you're absolutely right. The emotional connect goes away, right? Because we're not reading their body language, we're not doing chit chat, we're not talking about. We're, you know, usually we're not talking about personal stuff or things outside of of work, right? uh no those are usually ways how we build that personal equation that empathy right what i'm saying is even if your agenda is very very focused on the uh the business on the product you can still ask those questions because the real empathy comes from understanding what their major motivation is not really from that chit chat okay? the chit chat helps but you know it's really these are the deep questions which build that empathy so it's really as long as you can get these uh you can you can ask these questions you can get answers you can you can start recording where they get more emotional and and put more emphasis you can start recording what keywords they use and so you understand what how how, how they like to think about those priorities you you can understand what they want things to be you know question number 7 is what is their dream state you would have built such a strong empathy that uh you know it it might even be more powerful than what you get in a face to face and to go back to a previous question that param had asked is if you understand these questions and and you understand that for a, for a segment or cohort of customers put that in a video put that in a story put that in in your collateral because then they will they will connect to that message much more uh, strongly they will feel emotionally connected to your company and your product next question please sure uh, vishal is saying how do we get this methodology across the board in company i mean how do i get most of my sales team to follow this process um uh, vishal i mean it's um it, it's really about you know um it, it's like any any culture change any any habit change uh a they have to understand why it's important right b they have to understand how it's done right and c they have to practice so it's really you have to show them that it's important so it and you know again it goes back to it's important if it helps them achieve their goals 
Second thing is they have to be able to see that there is a process, there is a path to get there, that it's not, it's not rocket science, it's not something very complicated, it's not a black art, right? Uh, which is what we are trying to do in this session today. And third is as a matter of practice and feedback, right? Like any change, like any habit, you get better the more you do it. Right? How you do that, you know, every company has uh, their L&D process, they have their own, you know, culture change process, managers have to get involved, systems have to get involved, you might need to bring in some, some um, you know, focus training sessions, but uh, it's really these three steps that you follow. Uh, you know, it's all, the rest is all detail. Next question, please. All right, so we have last five minutes. Uh, so the next question is by Ashwin, who's saying, what strat strategy works when in the first call, customer asks for pricing without a meaningful first conversation? Share the pricing first. If it falls in range, then we'll schedule a call. Okay, that's a tough one. So, you know, uh, I would say two things here. One is that, um, and, 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 and it's, it's one of two scenarios. One is that, most of us, and, and that includes our customers, right? Most of us uh, like to get to the, the points that we can compare and measure, right? So, you know, there's this uh, very wise saying, not everything that's important can be measured and not everything that's, that can be measured is important. Uh, you know, price is like that. So price is something which is very easy for me to relate and compare, you know, as opposed to, let's say, quality of a product or as opposed to, you know, how that product fits. Uh, you know, I would dodge that question. If I was you, I would dodge that question. And I would I would actually turn that back and say, let's understand the price will depend on uh, exactly what we do for you. So let's understand a little bit more about you before we, you know, we will give you the pricing. We will ensure that you get a very good ROI on it, but we need to understand a little more context before we can give you a, an accurate price. You know, that's, that's the best way to handle that question. There are some customers who are, you know, who will insist, right? Um, not every customer is worth pursuing. Uh, you know, there are customers who are cheaper. There are customers who are just in it for the sport of it. They're not really serious customers. Um, those are customers I would fire anyways, right? So my personal view is uh, you should have that conversation, you know, try to bring them to value, try to bring them to understanding the context. Uh, without, you know, or, or before getting to the price question. If they resist, if they keep coming back to that question, probably not a customer you want anyways, right? Uh, if, if you feel like it, send them a price sheet and then just wait for them to come back. But, you know, reality is what would they do with that price sheet if they don't have the, the full context, okay? Now, there's one exception to this rule. One exception is if your product or your offering is a commodity and or it's perceived as a commodity by the customer. Okay, if that is the case, then you have to work elsewhere. You have to first fix that problem. What you have is a, is a, is a marketing problem, a positioning problem, or a, a product definition problem. You have to fix that before you, you know, um, before you can fix that challenge in the market. So what I see a lot of customers trying to do is a lot of lot of companies trying to do is, uh, you know, not really differentiate the product or their offering. They have a commodity offering, uh, and then they try to go out and try to position, try to change the differentiation with their marketing or their sales messaging. That's like putting lipstick on a pig. You know, that doesn't work. You really have to go deeper and make sure that you have something unique to offer. Uh, but if you do, absolutely, you have to command that that uh, differentiation of that premium. Okay. Next Very question. well answered, Supinder. Uh, so this would be the last question uh, from Lalit we will take up, uh, keeping the time limit in mind. Uh, considering economic implications of COVID-19, would being an empathetic listener mean being more open to understanding human difficulties and expecting lesser in sales numbers? Okay, so you know, th th I think that's a that's a wrong conflation. So there are three things you're saying in this, and and you're kind of conflating all three in one, and and I don't agree with that. So the first thing is you're saying, okay, in difficult times you have to be an empathetic listener, and that's absolutely true. But I'll say, you know, you have to be an empathetic listener in in all times. You know, when times are good, 
uh, even when uh, your uh, competitors are, or sorry, your customers are looking to grow, they're, they're seeing a boom time, you still have to have empathy, right? It's just that they have a different set of considerations, a different set of challenges. So empathy always, right? Second part is uh, when in that situation, do you have to uh, take their difficulties into account? Uh, again, you know, I'll say always, right? I mean, it's just the nature of the difficulties changes. In a good times, uh, they they you know they could have uh, uh, issues with with servicing demand. They could have issues with quality of their production because you know there's so much uh, you know they, they have to grow faster. They, maybe they're not finding enough talent or the right quality people. I mean, whatever the challenges are, you know we always have challenges, right? So this is the nature of those challenges changes. The third point is that you're saying therefore we have to expect less sales. Um, you know what i'm seeing some companies actually grow their sales and i'm not just talking about companies like zoom um there's many companies who are you know so uh, i work with for example uh you know i work with omnivore and we have uh, a lot of companies in the agro sector I mean, that's we focus on agro sector investments and what we find is that uh there's actually you know some companies are doing better in these times okay so it's really i think what you have to do is you have to understand what the customer's needs are and you have to adapt your product your offering your messaging to what their needs are and you might actually see sales grow you know of course the when the economy shrinks uh as an average a business will will shrink right but um you know, good times or bad times, you still have to compete. And if you out compete, you will win good times or bad times. In fact, uh, in the last session, what we had shared, if you look at uh, the Farmga, the five Farmga companies, right? Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, three of those five were born during a recession or faced a recession within like a year or so of being born. So bad times don't necessarily mean bad business. In fact, sometimes, uh, you know, those are the best times to create a strong business. Okay. Um, with that, I believe we're out of time. So I'm just gonna, you know, uh, repeat. So thank you very much. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Again, I've shared the, the LinkedIn uh, URL, uh, you know, through chat. Uh, you know, please post more questions. If you have questions, post them there. I will definitely answer those. And you know, they will go to the community, so everybody will benefit. People, you know, and others can also post their responses. Uh, any suggestions on future sessions? What else would you like to hear uh, from from Nascom products? And you know, if you have any stories to share, please share. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Subinda, for coming forward and delivering a session around empathy, such a significant uh, subject. In order to um, create and sell innovative products, empathy is so important. Just reminded me of the movie Joker I watched. I believe the protagonist was looking forward for empathy throughout the movie. So this is so important. Thanks for sharing this subject, touching the subject, and sharing your perspective. And as Subinda said, uh, questions were many, and we were able to cater to most of them. So you can get in touch with him over LinkedIn. And I will meet all of you tomorrow at 4:30 with a topic from data science ethical AI and breaking the bubbles. To register, please visit nascom.in slash events. Thank you everyone for your time and efforts. Thank you, Subinda. Thank you so much. Thank you.